so when I was living in the States, uh, I was renting this excellent apartment building uh, from 1914, and it had a sunroom at the front of, of it. And I don't think the sunroom was intended to become a workshop, but I made it a workshop. Yeah. And managing all the dust was uh, the, the most challenging component of that. But I did all the woodworking in that little tiny sunroom. Uh, I couldn't do too much over the winter because it was single pane glass, the concrete floor, super cold. Right. Uh, but some days I still got out there. Uh, and the firm I was working at was also kind enough to donate shop time after hours, assuming that I brought my own consumables. So I had, oh, nice. you know, had all my old end mills and my drills and my taps and all of that kind of material. Yeah. Uh, so I was doing metalworking uh, component of, of the of the tables uh, there after hours and then doing the wood uh, at my converted workshop and then figured out how to put stuff together. Uh, since I moved back to my native Canada, a project kind of got put on hold just because I didn't necessarily have the same level of facility that I did mm -hmm. in the States. Uh, but uh, I moved last summer and I've been able to do some work in the front yard again. And recently, actually yesterday, finished building some planter boxes. Oh, nice. So some nice, uh, some cedar and aluminum, yeah, raised garden beds. Going to try and plant them this afternoon. Try and uh, after this, take a, a nice Friday afternoon off and look forward to see it also what I can get done over the weekend. Yeah, that was um, that was one of my COVID projects was I built some some planter boxes for my wife. And uh, it was it was it was fun. It helped pass the time for sure. <laughs> The the one thing I did learn in the what have been I twenty eighteen was the last time that I had been building stuff in the states so I guess about five years give yeah. or take uh, five years older and I can't do as many things on the ground as I used to so I need to <laughs> elevate the work to a certain level I built the planter boxes like entirely on the ground yeah and uh, I was I was a little sore yeah yeah we. Um... So we just we just bought a new home and we're um, there's an area of the basement that's actually got a walkout area that I'm going to convert into a to a shop because I love I love doing kind of the same thing building the furniture and and um, woodworking and whatnot. But um, I'm I'm 100 with you. In fact, the guy that was here before me actually had this super nice bench that he had built and he left. And so I'm really excited to be able to like <laughs> utilize that and not be on the ground when I'm building stuff. So, but yeah, quick shout out to well, yeah, oh, this, maybe getting some other stuff built this, uh, this summer. It's always nice when you've got room for projects. Yeah, exactly. Well, Hey, quick shout out to everybody who's joined us so far. Andrew and I are just having a little bit of a, a, a pre-show conversation, but, uh, let us know in the chat if you do a little bit of woodworking uh, on your uh, in your free time, um, but we'll get uh, we'll kick things off here uh, here shortly. Uh, One of the other projects that I uh, I worked on was a, I designed and built a, this record table. Uh, to, my wife had bought me a, a record player, and that was a lot of fun designing it up in SolidWorks and then figuring out how to cut you know basically make it you know and and get it built. Um, and it was it's a good little project. It was fun. SolidWorks is, you know, we use it a lot in, uh, in our professional capability, uh, but people forget that it is a, a really powerful tool in, uh, in doing the home projects. Uh, you know, weldment functionality for anything made out of you know, stock lumber. You, know, mm -hmm. you can just create everything and then you don't have to figure out what you need at the big orange box. Uh, you know, you get the weldment to, uh, to spit out the cut list for you. Yeah. And, you know, it still means that you're not going to get everything in, in one trip. Right. But there's always right. going to be something that you forgot or you needed four extra screws and you only had a box of 100 because <laughs> <laughs> you didn't go to the effort of putting every single screw into the CAD model. But I make it's a, I was running a joke with my wife, the number of times that I end up having to drive to uh, the hardware store or the, the, you know, the big box store every time I do a, um, a home improvement project <laughs> for sure. I'm lucky that it's only a, a 10 minute drive over there, but it, uh, it still adds up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, Hey, let's, uh, let's kick things off. I want to welcome you to SolidWorks live. All of you who are joining uh, us today. Um, we're going to be going through a really uh, fascinating topic on fillets and blends with my guest, Andrew Lowe. 
But before we kick things off, uh, keep in mind that as you have questions, as you have comments, if you want to provide some feedback, enter it in the chat. I'll do my best to keep an eye on that and feed those to uh, Andrew as we go. So as I said, Andrew Lowe is our guest today. He's a CSWE. He's presented at 3D Experience World many times, kind of a, a fan favorite uh, when it comes to world. Uh, and so, Andrew, welcome. Tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and the company you're with. Well, thanks, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, really excited to do one of these live sessions, a little bit different than the content I have presented in the past at World because I get asked questions. Uh, so I am a trained industrial designer. Uh, I've been working in product development my entire career, mostly at uh, product development consultancies which has been an awesome opportunity in that we get to work on pretty much everything, right? We're, we're client-based work and you, you don't necessarily know what the next thing you might be working on is. Uh, so currently with my role at Cortex Design, uh, I oversee the industrial design team and design engineering team, help a little bit with embedded systems, work with uh, some of the production that we do in-house. And Cortex Design, we're a 1345 uh, certified Product development firm, yeah. mostly in the medical technology space. You know, we tend to work on things that are are smaller, are are handheld. Uh, there's an electronic component to the products that we we help develop, uh, and the production methods are you know lots of plastic injection molding, you know, die casting. We have the ability to shape and form products, you know, with a lot of design flexibility. You know, we're not necessarily working in sheet metal or with, with weld mitts. And, and out of that comes the need to create really nice aesthetics and cosmetic surfaces on these, these products. And in, I guess, 18 years now of, of using SolidWorks, I've figured out a thing or two to how to get you know, really nice fillets and blends on models and how to uh, you know, control some of those transitions. So that way you can model what the product wants to be rather than what SolidWorks might give you if you were just using some of the more um, simple kind of extrudes and revolves and fillets and such. Yeah, yeah. And you and I were chatting a little bit about this, that the um, that fillets obviously have a play blend, fillets and blends play a huge role in obviously industrial design. But even if you're a machine designer or just a casual SolidWorks user, understanding them in general can have a lot of benefits to just you know, how you go about doing a design. Certainly, uh, you know, there's there's different orders, there's different qualities of the fillet tool. Uh, you know, if, I, if I get into this here, let me find some of my uh, my slides. Yeah, yeah. And uh, share screen. So if we're looking at this particular example here, uh, this is called, I don't know why it's called this, but it was called the teddy bear corner, where you had these three different kind of or square shapes coming each other. Yeah. Uh, you know, kind of a cube with uh, some portions missing. And if you're just using the, the fillet tool with the, the standard constant radius fillet, it's trying to keep the radius of that entirely the same through all of those different fillets. But sometimes the radius wants to deviate or perhaps it doesn't want to be a radius, it wants to be some other kind of, of geometry rather than a mm -hmm. section of an arc. Uh, and that's where blending comes in. And then, so you look at this example, in order to get this, the example on the right in red, this is just the fillet tool. Um, and then if you do a little bit of extra work, you get a blend transition between them. And in, in a 3D view here, I think on this view, you can kind of see that the fillet example tucks in, right? It's kind of yeah, like almost uh, puckering in in the middle there, whereas the blend geometry looks just right. So uh, and real so, quick, is this is so is that a visual phenomenon or can you actually feel the you called it like the pucker in like if, if you had an actual product and you rubbed your thumb over it, would you feel that indention or is it just visual? Oh, 100 percent. So that would okay. be, you know, this is this is not necessarily a visual construct in terms of the way that the shading, you know, is happening in SolidWorks. This is you know, a geometric construct. Okay. Um, I might even have no, don't have a section through the middle here, uh, okay. but I will say that you can feel a lot of these kind of deviations when you don't necessarily get the, the fillets quite right. Um, okay. And also you can see them a lot of the time um, and it moves. You know, so maybe we'll, we'll take a step back and you asked a little bit earlier, if you were you know, an industrial designer versus say a machine designer, uh, you know, why should you care about fillets? Um, and 
you know, fillets aren't pretty much everything that we touch. Like look at the prevalence of the rectangle with rounded corners. Like that is a very, very common product design um, way of, of styling something. You know, yeah. the, the iPhone has really helped you know, popularize this thin slab of material uh, with, the, with the clean rounded corners, but actually these are not fillets. Um, and these were very carefully sculpted blends. Uh, likewise, a lot of these examples here, they might look like fillets, but they are transitions that have been modeled manually to have the highest possible fidelity of the look of that. Um, if we, SolidWorks added, I think in 2014, the ability to add a curvature continuous fillet uh, mm -hmm. and versus the, the standard a constant radius fillet. And so constant radius fillet is built with an arc. The curvature continuous is built with a uh, with a spline transition. And why does that actually matter? And I'm going to jump forward a few slides here, and then we can jump back. Uh, so a little bit of a thought experiment for everyone in the audience. Uh, I'd like to ask you to be a limo driver for a second. Uh, and if you were a limo driver, what would be a smoother ride for your passengers? Uh, if you were to quickly jerk the wheel, you know, all the way over and then quickly jerk it back or to slowly turn the steering wheel to complete the corner and then turn it back. Um, you know, Steve, I think you know the answer to this. Yeah, I would want the smoothest. Yeah, the smoothest option, right? I don't want to be thrown around. <laughs> Because I ride in a limo a lot, I actually, you know. Yeah, I saw an article that these stretch limousines are going <laughs> out of favor uh, with the people who have the resources to ride in them. That, uh, that the SUV is is much more popular these days. Yeah. But yeah. you know, what does that actually mean for for fillets? Um, so the the practical SolidWorks, the practical geometric application of that thought experiment is is a way of explaining continuity. Um, and so continuity refers to the level of connection uh, in between different surface transitions. So I have four different examples uh, up on this slide. I have uh, going through G0 through G3. Uh, and SolidWorks is able to do these different uh, styles of connections with various relations that exist. Uh, so we have G0 contact where things come together, but they may not uh, be smooth. So this would be a sharp edge um, on a model or on a product. Uh, and then we move up the, the order to G1. This is an arc-based transition. And so I've showed the curvature cones, uh, which show the rate of change of the radius. And an arc can't change its radius. You could put two arcs together to have two of the same radius, but they're always the same. Uh, and then G2, uh, or curvature continuous, the radius through the transition is able to, to change itself. And this is why we need a spline to represent that style of geometry rather than an arc, because a spline can have changing curvature as compared to a constant radius arc. Uh, and then if we look at the highest order or torsion continuity, which in SolidWorks either 2020 or 2021, they added the torsion continuity relation at sketch level, uh, but it's not yet, uh, it doesn't exist at the feature level. Um, and we'll we'll look into how we can leverage that for for manually building some uh, some fillets. Uh, but the difference between G two G three is the acceleration of the curvature is consistent okay. or gradual with G three, and that's how you can see that uh, that smoother connection between the different portions here versus G two curvature, where it's technically smooth, but it doesn't have that gentle ramp that sure. uh, G three has. So uh, real quick, so the, the G designation is somewhat new to me. I, like I've heard C1, C2. What's, is, there a, is there a distinction between when those, the, those letters get used and the difference? They're interchangeable. Uh, okay. I'm sure someone who's a little bit wiser than me uh, can tell you the difference. My understanding is that C refers to curvature continuity. And so if you just had 2D shapes, you could use curvature because you're just looking at the curvature of the sure. like the math function is defining it. Yeah. Whereas G refers to geometric continuity. So if you're looking at that geometric continuity along a 3D surface as compared to a, a 2D section. That makes total sense. 
Just a, just a reminder for those of you in our audience, if you have questions, uh, feel free to ask them in the, in the chat. Um, we'll do our best to funnel them to, uh, to Andrew. So, um, perfect. This is, this is quite interesting. Yeah, so moving along that example, um, you know, I think if we, we jump into SolidWorks here, I'm just doing a couple quick sketch examples of what this actually might look like. So mm -hmm. if I were to create a, a new part, you know, we can, maybe we're doing a small little electronics enclosure. We'll call it 150 millimeters square and we can extrude this. Maybe it's uh, 25 millimeters tall and we're going to have a little bit of draft on this. It'll be a plastic part that we can, we can shell out. So the classic way of, of rounding this, and we see this a lot, is we grab the fillet tool. Maybe we want a 25 millimeter corner radius. Uh, we use the circular or radial type option. You know, I can even use the quick little select to grab all those edges. Maybe I want these to be a little bit bigger and I can round off my, you know, my corners. Uh, but what does that mean for the quality of the transition? Um, and so if I was to examine the curvature uh, using the curvature display tool, I can see that the curvature doesn't change. Uh, and so I have a constant radius of curvature, 30 millimeters to a flat. Um, yeah. And visually what this means is that I, if I were to apply, let's say a, a really shiny material, let's go chromium plate. Um, maybe this thing's not actually chromium plate, but it just helps the example. And I can turn on some of the real view graphics. I could potentially see a very, I don't know, it's almost, I don't know if it'll catch on the live stream, but you can almost see how that black yeah. in the environment quickly jumps across that edge. Uh, and another way of looking at this is with the zebra stripes. Uh, so what zebra stripes do is imagine the part has perfect chrome finish and we're putting it into a room of lights and there's a bunch of overhead strip lights. Uh, if you've ever seen a, an automotive production facility, sometimes you'll see at the end, there's people inspecting the, the paint on the cars. Yeah. There's these overhead lights that are very long and they're, they're essentially doing this. They're looking to see if there's any kind of defects in the sheet metal or in the paint. Um, because those, those, you'll see those little minor blips in the reflections. So, so what's interesting about this is I never fully understood zebra stripes until one day I got my car washed and I pulled in at night to a gas station and I looked at the reflections of the light in the the finish of my car and I'm like, holy cow, those are zebra stripes. And you and you're right, you can actually see how they bend and how they curve across the you know the curvature of the body. It's it's quite yeah. interesting. And so why this actually matters is we can't geometrically define, you know, let's say uh, the surface of a car, right? With a single surface, there's going to be multiple different surfaces that are put together um, in order to create those shapes. We wanna make sure that the different model surfaces, you know, here we have, uh, what, six sides on the per eight surfaces total. Right. Mm -hmm. If we were to turn off the, this is a distinct surface, this is a distinct surface, this is a distinct surface, and there is a level of transition between them. Yep. So how do we ensure that that has that smoothest possible transition? And so if we're looking at what zebra stripes means, zebra stripes on a G1 connection have a hard break. Um, and you can see this with a lot of products that might have just been sculpted, say, with the fillet tool rather than potentially modeled is you'll see a very distinct break where the the fillet was to start and stop so it's almost like you know when you're looking at the product in real life you can actually see that model edge of you yeah. know where exactly the fillet starts and where exactly the fillet stops um, and that's what this hard break in the uh, in the transition in the radius uh, was to likewise if we were to start a sketch here and we can convert this in these are actually sections of arcs because I added a uh, draft to it. But if I were to show the curvature combs, we can see, see that I have this very abrupt transition, right? There's no curvature on a straight edge. And then immediately the curvature starts at a particular radius. So, uh, so Andrew, this is this, I think this is a really important point. You know, we, you showed users some of these analysis tools, like the, the, um, the zebra stripes, which, what tool did you just show related to the sketch? So this is, uh, if I were to pick a curved sketch element, I, I have a 
you know, custom toolbar set up and I have show curvature comb. So I can get to it that way. Yep. I can right click on things and I can show curvature combs and I should be able to, oh, for an ellipse, it won't let me, but I believe on a spline on the toolbar on the left in the, yep. the property manager, you can toggle the curvature combs on. Uh, one interesting setting, if you are using this, uh, and this isn't out of the box, is on my configuration. I like changing the color. The default yeah. yellow is kind of difficult to see in a white background, so I've changed mine to purple. They show up a lot uh, cleaner. Yeah. And I also, there's an option, and I'll have to bring this over, under sketch to uh, show curvature comb bounding curve. Okay. Uh, so, I, and this is off by default, but if I have this off, you can see I don't get that clean line. Mm -hmm. um, and so before this was an option, you could tweak the curvature settings to add a lot more lines to kind of get an, an understanding. But I, I just like that bounding curve at the top. Uh, so we had a quick question on. from one of the uh, one of the people in our chat, Ron, that was asking what version of SolidWorks are you using? Uh, so this is SOLIDWORKS 2021 uh, Service Pack 5, but okay. pretty much everything that we're talking about today uh, would go back to SOLIDWORKS 2014. Um, sure. And we'll see why in a second. In SOLIDWORKS 2014, they introduced the style spline. Um, and even if you're not using the most recent version of SOLIDWORKS, uh, either 2020 or 2021, where they introduced the torsion continuity relation, there's a way that we can do those back G3 connections without that relation. Got it. Got it. All right. So we've got this design. We've got a basically tangent radius uh, connecting these faces yep. right now. And we're going to take a look at what the next order or G2 uh, continuity would be. And so I'm going to change my profile to curvature continuous from circular. And if we look at our curvature display, we can actually see that our curvature has changed. Instead of it being solid green, there mm -hmm. is a gradient uh, to our curvature. And if we were to run our mouse over, you'd see that little pink, uh, maybe we'll move it down. So curvature zero, which makes sense on the flat. And then as I just start getting into here, we can see that the curvature is actually changing along the length. It's yep. no longer that constant 30. And so it's taking a mathematical, you know, the, the 30 millimeter radius doesn't actually apply to anything anymore because there's a changing radius. It's more just the overall size that this fillet uh, was to start at. But I, I'm going to jump back a second because and change this to a circular. And I'm gonna create a quick sketch on the top plane I want to make a snapshot of where this is right now. So I'm going to select all my relations, display delete. I'm going to delete all my relations so I don't have anything. And because there's no relations, when I change, I can move this up above the fillet. And now when I change my fillet to curvature continuous, I have a little snapshot of where my fillet used to be. Got it. But if I'm looking at this and I'll change my sketch color so it's a little bit easier to see. Let's go with the orange here. The, the curvature continuous fillet actually looks smaller than the previous uh, G1 or tangent fillet. You can see that we've added a little bit more material in the corner. Yep. And the reason that happens is because we actually need more room if we were to convert and, uh, and show our curvature cones. We actually need some more room for that feature to start you know, for that gradual acceleration to happen. Gotcha. Um, and even okay. with the out of the box option, because it's being applied, we see a little bit of jitter in the curvature uh, being applied to the drafted face. And so if we wanted a you know, very beautiful transition here, especially because this shape is so simple, right? We want to have these very perfectly sculpted corners. I would be looking to create this uh, manually with the uh, with some sketches rather than relying on the fillet. Interesting. Uh, okay. Maybe if, you know, I didn't want to quite go to that level just because of the level of time, you know, maybe this is just for a quick volume study as part of the design process that I'm not doing my final sculpted production level uh, CAD geometry. You know, I'm, I'm quickly working through concepts. You know, this is totally acceptable, you know, for just nailing the overall shape. I wouldn't go to that level. 
Um, but what I would want to do is increase the size of my fillet. And the, the factor I've found, and this is totally unscientific, is if you're going with a curvature continuous fillet, you would like to be about 1.4 times as large to visually look the same. So I can, oh, I don't want to global variable. Oh, it's a, probably because of the X I need to do mass risk. So that would correspond with 42 millimeters or about 40% bigger. And if we now look at the top, you know, we have a very similar sized transition visually as we did before. So it's that kind of 40% multiplier. Okay. You found that that as a general rule gets you closer to what the original radius, like a, a normal radius would have been. Exactly. Yeah. But so visually it's looking the same, but uh, you know, from a, you know, if I was to put a, a drawing view down here with my, like I said, with my, my fillets, I would almost have the same kind of size, but visually they look a lot smoother. Um, and then we go to the next higher order. So maybe I was doing the final production sculpting of this. Uh, it's actually about 80% when it comes to G3. Oh, okay. That's good. So to if know. I was to roll up to my original feature, um, maybe we'll just unabsorb this. So I have my sketch. And what I like doing is sketching in with a arc radius, how big I would like my G3 radius to be. If we are looking to approximate the arc rather than you know have a different kind of, of fillet shape. I just want to have this very smooth looking arc. So I have my, my 30 millimeter corners and I can exit out of my first sketch and I might call it, rename this and this is my top layout. I can start another sketch on the top plane and I, oh, and I'll convert this in. And now I can turn these for construction. I have some symmetry, so we'll just work in one corner rather than have to do this for separate times. I use my trim, the power trim option to drag these back a little bit. And then I can set up a larger arc to control this. And I might also look to set up some uh, global variables, perhaps for that 80%. But in this, we'll just take the shortcut and we'll do times 1.8. So I actually need a 54 millimeter radius on the start and stop um, to be able to visually match the size of the, the G1 radius. Okay, so I'm gonna, gonna pause you just for a minute. So, so you converted that original sketch, created a new one. Exactly. So here's my original one that controls what I want it to look like. Okay. And then this is some of the setup work to push these corners back. And I okay. found that having multiple sketches is a little bit more stable than trying to do everything all in the same sketch. Sure. Just, so this is just used to lay out how large I want this transition to be. So you basically you're basically you're you're defining where your start points exactly. Are We're going just to be using that with a blend. radius, and I might, like I said, I might set up some equations so that way I have those. Uh, you know, I quickly set up variables and such. So that way, I'm changing my original sketch. These things would also update. It's just a matter of how right. how deep into the parametrics you want to set things up with. Okay. So my last bit, I'll convert this sketch in again. We'll hide our top layout. We'll hide this sketch. This guy becomes for construction, and I need to use the style spline um, for this. I use a, a Bezier option, and I'm gonna we're gonna go through a little experiment to uh, to show how the style spline uh, operates with different levels of continuity. So I'm gonna set up uh, something. So this has two little control segments in each option, and it's linked to this. And if I was to grab the line and the style spline, I can add the equal curvature relation and I can add the equal curvature relation in this direction. And you'll notice something that happened here. And what happened was that these construction lines that define the sketch fully constrained themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so in order to support a either tangent or curvature continuous or torsion continuous, relation to this line here, 
these control segments must be collinear with this. Right. And with this, even if you don't have, you know, and if we drag these a little bit further back, I can now start approximating, not if I try to over constrain it, I start approximating the, the arc here. Or actually, I want to approximate this here. And a way that we can also look to constrain these is we can set these to be equal to each other. Uh, and by setting them equal, it's over constrained the curvature relation in this direction. But we can set them both collinear and equal. They don't want to be equal to this. They want to be collinear here. If I picked everything correctly, and now I have a fully black uh, style spline. And if we do the same thing here, now um, I have we got my fully defined sketch and it is parametric. Um, note that this looks a little bit smaller because we were looking to do the, uh, we had the setback for the G3 and this is only G2 because I have two control segments. Right. Uh, so if we turn on our curvature combs, we see it is smooth, but it doesn't have that gradual acceleration. Right. Um, so to go to the next level, I need to create a style spline that has three uh, sections. Um, oh, we've got a question in chat from Naloy. Uh, yeah, which what degree, degree wanted to know what degree Bezier curve is it, and what are the degrees which are available? Was so it... in this option, the difference between Bezier and B spline, I'm not familiar with. Uh, I just use the Bezier and then you can tweak the degree of Bezier. And so the degree is equal to the number of segments in the control, um, whatever this is called, you know, the, sure. the control lines and the control vertices that actually shape the style spline because you state the style spline with these points as compared to the tangency handles that the classic spline tool uses. Um, and so if we look at this one, I have three in this direction, three in this direction, six total. And when we look at our Bezier curve, our curve degree is six. Is six and I can right. okay. increase this to seven, eight, nine. It just indicates the number of control segments. And at a minimum, you have to have two, right? two lines, a single vertice. Um, but the higher order of curvature you want to match to the more, the higher curve degree must be. So in this situation, I need at least six because cur or the torsion continuity for my G3 connection is going to take up three uh, control segments in each direction. Okay. So I'm going to, there's two ways I can go about doing this. I'm going to select all these. I'm going to make them collinear and then make them equal. And then I'll once again, pick this line and make them collinear. We can drag them up over and we'll do the same thing over here. We're going to make them all equal to each other. We're gonna make them collinear and then we'll snap them collinear to our existing line segment. And it looks like something was, so sometimes this happens, I don't know why, everything is fully constrained but it hasn't actually snapped fully constrained, uh, but it is, uh, it might be that this line is, oh, yeah, and there, I just you know, dragged <laughs> something and, and it uh, it figured itself out. But if we were to show our original layout, you know, we do have a shape that is parametrically driven now and is very close to the original arc that I was looking to sketch, but I didn't need to make it much larger. Yep. And if we were to look at the curvature combs, now I have that gradual lead in. Um, and this is the style of, of transition and corner that, that uh, you know, perfectly sculpted uh, Apple iPhone would have, um, you know, that this is going to have those seamless highlights. So Steve, when you were talking about your car example, you wouldn't see, um, you know, anything in the reflections on that surface and that it would look seamless. You couldn't right. tell where the straight versus the arc section uh, were, were to begin. Uh, and it. in this example, let's just quickly create a surface extrude. So we have some geometry here and we can take a look at our curvature. So our curvature has, you know, it's, it's starting black in this, right? It's, it's almost nothing. And, it's, and that's that smooth acceleration that we had seen before as compared to the, the G2 uh, or the curvature continuous fill it out of the box. And we can see that the radius gradually, gradually gets larger 
that. And we're able to create our, our geometry. So Andrew, as you, as you start to design these types of products, are you, are you always going to G2 or are you making decisions on partly based on the, the manufacturing cost involved in the decision you're making on the curvature? So manufacturing cost, there were not assuming that the part was going into an injection mold. So, you know, it's going to be a plastic part. It's a lot of the products that we work on, there would not be a you know significant cost because that injection mold is going to be CNC machined. It's going to be uh, EDM to get some of the details. It might be hand polished and then textured, uh, sure. and that process you know, the, it doesn't matter kind of what radius you had. Okay. Um, but say I was. You know, and, and likewise, certain processes inherently give you curvature continuous transitions. So if I was designing a sheet metal product, I wouldn't worry about controlling these very particular kind of bends. Right. Because <laughs> inherently, when that material stretches, it's going to do what it wants to do. And I don't get a situation where I have a very sharp transition to that because the, as that metal is folded, that corner inherently becomes curvature continuous. Um, and it, and I would just yeah. be relying on the sheet metal tools. But if I was doing a stamping per se, you know, I would want to have this controlled geometry uh, and, and use that actual modeling. So right. it doesn't impact the, the manufacturing or the cost. It does impact the the style of product that you're looking to have. OK, um, you know, sometimes you want to have those those sharper uh, transitions. I'm going to show a couple different examples. Uh, if I jump back to some of my slides here, uh, so running back up to the top of the deck, I just had some examples of products that uh, we've worked on at Cortex and some of the reasons why you might want to have one particular style of product uh, than another. Uh, so this is a, a product that was intended to be used by law enforcement um, for certain kinds of uh, roadside screenings. And this product, because we wanted to have that more rugged utilitarian nature, the mm -hmm. radiuses were intentionally kept G1 because we liked that, that sharper, more uh, purposeful aesthetic of, of where you could see model edges. Or, yeah. or the shapes versus having something that felt a little bit smoother, felt a little bit softer. We felt that that particular style direction would resonate with the target user. Um, you know, and, and it does lend itself well to this kind of very rugged, techy aesthetic. Yeah. Uh, um, but this device was uh, something that we designed for a, a company here in Toronto that is working on certain kinds of surgical uh, rehabilitation um, with electrical uh, impulses. And so this device is actually meant to be disposable um, after the treatment has been uh, performed, but we wanted it to feel a little bit softer, right? A little bit more intentional. So all of these transitions were actually manually modeled um, to have those really nice, crisp uh, highlights you can see on the gloss portion of the device versus mm -hmm. the more matte version. And we wanted it to still look, um, you know, look intentional, not necessarily look rounded like a pebble, we still sure. wanted it to to have that visual fidelity. Got it. Uh, likewise, this was you know a product where there wasn't a lot of uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of detail in the form. It was a very simple shape. You know, it was a trapezoid with with rounded or sorry parallelogram with rounded corners. Uh, and in this case, we were looking to perfectly sculpt those corners. Uh, this was a COVID nineteen rapid diagnostic that we designed uh, during the pandemic. Um, likewise, you know, this is a, this is a product for detecting, uh, certain kinds of infection after certain kinds of uh, surgery when the patient is still recovering at the hospital. And because this device is being worn on them and the patient's in bed, we wanted to have a very smooth, uh, sculpted, almost pebble like appearance. So that way the device was very soft. If you were you know, sleeping and you accidentally rolled over and it was, was underneath you, we didn't want that to. You know, have hard edges, and so this was an example where everything was of the you know the G3 uh, connection, and we had that very smooth, uh, sculpted, almost like a you know a pebble that you find on the beach that's been worn smooth by the the nature of the tides over time. Got it, got it. So maybe you're going to take us here next, but how do you how do you go about 
so we looked at kind of those that 2D profile example, but how do you go about achieving this in like three dimensions where, you know, like I've got kind of that, would you, you know, the teddy bear example or a, or a corner that's coming together? Oh, well, I'm glad that you asked, Steve, because uh, I've actually got a baked out example that we can, uh, oh, perfect. We can run through. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to, I'll just, uh, I'll jump to the end here. Uh, actually, no, we'll jump into SolidWorks. I think it'll be a little bit faster. And let's bring up the completed model. And I want to, uh, this is something that's more than just a, you know, a corner. I do want to have uh, you know, a little bit more you know, geometry, a little bit more nuance to the shape. Yeah, while you're bringing that up, if you have, again, if you guys have questions about this, by all means, add them to the chat. Andrew, I think you're getting a couple suggestions for maybe a couple YouTube videos about modeling uh, modeling a Definitely. coffee mug handle and, and whatnot. Make a video so. on the handle profile of a coffee mug. Yeah, that's an interesting example of, you know, want to have that, that handle blend out nicely, you know, for yeah. that slip cast uh, ceramic. Uh, we're just going to hide the cameras. Cool. And I think we're going to turn off perspective because it's going to jump around. Uh, so this was just a little imaginary device that I had whipped up for presentation this year at uh, Three Experience World. Uh, you know, it could be anything. You know, but uh, one of the hallmarks of this design uh, was that we were going to incorporate a uh, rounded LCD display. Um, you know, rather than having something square, perhaps the particular functionality and user interface that was determined, you know, it made sense to have it round. For whatever reason but that's the nice thing when you're just imagining shapes is you don't really have to justify the function and uh, and justify what it's actually designed to do sure um, but this example brings up a couple interesting uh, tidbits and that also plays into the use of the style spline and now in later versions of solidworks the g3 torsion continuity uh, relation so I have a very simple layout sketch and I have a slot entity and then I have a call out for the raised portion where I'm going to have my display. I don't want to have it on the same flat face as the model. I would like to elevate the display from a styles perspective so that way it's a little bit more prominent, uh, a little bit clearer to the user. Uh, but if we were to look at our curvature of a slot, once again, I have this very abrupt transition and mm -hmm. I want to smooth that out. And so I need to create a, a bit of a transition where I have a portion here that's being replicated by a style spline rather than it being an arc. Uh, and so in the same way that I had used the uh, fillet tool at the sketch level to call out a larger transition, here I have some lines being used to split out uh, a little area that I'll replace with my G3 connection. And I'm just using some uh, some angles here to, to fully constrain these lines. Okay. So I, I have my splits. So I'm just calling that this is the little area that I need to create my, my G3 transition. Uh, and I'm jumping in here. And there's a couple ways I can go about doing this. I can manually eyeball it here. So I can kind of you know, drag this to where it's almost at the point that my style spline works. But if we were to start from scratch, what I'd like to do for this perfect transition is style spline. And I know I need degree six because I have my three control segments each direction. So I could even create this and go up to six. I'm going to set the first bits to be equal. And in the second portion, I'm also going to set them to be equal. And with this example, I can set them to be collinear. And I'll need to just, before I do this, I find it prudent to kind of drag the shape to almost where you want it to be. There's sure. a tendency to uh, not over constrain itself. And then I can set the torsion continuity. And because I had set all those segments to be equal to each other, it's now fully constrained. So I don't have to worry about those oh, points nice. moving in space. I have a fully black style spline. Yeah. Uh, question in chat, how did I side upon the angles uh, experience? Um, <laughs> you know, sometimes you want a little bit more. I just kind of play around with the angles and that's why I like having this driven parametrically so I can you know, turn on my style spline and, uh, and have that, that very gradual transition. Got it. So I now have that smooth transition that I can use uh, to 
create uh, some model geometry. And this is going to disagree with me because I deleted uh, in the sake of the examples. We'll just reload so I don't have the, uh, the dangling sketch. And we'll run back up in the tree and turn off that camera. So running back, and I'll turn on model edges so it's a little bit easier to see. Uh, I'm starting with a solid, right? Rather than starting with surfaces, I get more features all at once. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I started with a solid is I wanted to do a cutback. So there's going in, in industrial design, we kind of call this a pillow top or a crown top. But you'll see it in a lot of uh, electro or consumer electronics, medical devices, et cetera, et cetera. It's that hallmark shape on the top of a laptop where you have a very flat shape and then it looks like it, it tapers off on the edges. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, and in order to do that, I need to get some new model edges. Um, and I'm accomplishing that with a cut. And actually, I'm accomplishing that with a cut with a thin feature. So I'm just using this to, to create some new edges. Yep. Um, you know, when you're surface modeling, you're, you're more worried about the edges and the faces, uh, you know, solid modeling, you care about the overall shape, um, but solid modeling is a great way of getting you faces, getting you edges to be able to, uh, you know, work with the, uh, with the geometry. Uh, one thing I do want to call out though, uh, is that depending on how, uh, you know, so actually this is converted is the way that SolidWorks is handling offsets. So this is an example where I've offset everything and I'm showing the curvature comb. So I have this 12 millimeter offset dimension. Um, and unfortunately, it doesn't handle the offset of splines the best. You can actually see that there's this weird kind of like taper in the curvature. Sure. Um, and so when you're doing this kind of final and, and actually in an example, uh, you know, the, the, the larger the radius, the tighter this actually gets. So if I set this to say 18, you can see that that, that issue is oh, exaggerating yeah. itself. The, the, it's starting to get very sharp in this corner. And you can almost see that with, uh, with shells, you know, so using the shell feature with curvature, continuous geometry, those, mm -hmm. uh, those radii get super tight. Uh, we just do a quick example of that to help demonstrate this phenomenon. So if I had a block here and I radius the corner, maybe 25 to really show this off, I'm going to go curvature continuous. And then let's shell this part with a 10 millimeter wall. I'm going to pick these faces because we want them to go away. You know, my corner starts getting very, very sharp. And, and this exaggerates uh, the bigger the, the shell is and the bigger the offset. So in this, you know, it's almost perfectly sharp there. And the shell right. tools actually split this into two faces. Uh, it's just the way that SolidWorks handles the, uh, the offsets. Uh, but you can work around. It's a little bit more uh, work, but it just means in this sketch example, uh, what I've done is created my own. I just used the offset tool to get me the arc mm -hmm. and the line because that's mathematically offsets perfectly. Uh, and then I've created a new uh, style spline here. And if I wanted to link these parametrically a little bit more, I could actually pick the control segments one by one. So I could pick this one and I could pick this one and I could go along and I could make them all parallel to each other. So that way, as things move, the angles of those control segments are always locked in and it's just the overall distance. Uh, so that's a little workaround to do uh, parametric uh, offsets of, of splines. I just didn't go to those those extra steps in this example. Yeah, I think this really illustrates too the importance of like really leveraging those curvature combs, especially if you're doing this day in and day out, because honestly, you would have likely never even noticed that had you not had the curvature combs on. Exactly. You know, I think it's when we're you we're working with surfaces and doing this surface style modeling, it is up to the operator, right? It's up to the person running SolidWorks to get the geometry that they need. And that's the power of surface modeling is that you can do anything you want mm -hmm. uh, and create any shape you would like. It's just, it's more involved. It's, there's more knowledge that's required and there's a higher learning curve as compared to solid modeling. And if solid modeling can get you there, by all means use solid modeling because it's more sure. robust, it's faster, it's easier for other people to understand what you're doing. But if the only way of getting a shape 
you know, is with, uh, you know, with the surface tools, then, you know, the shape is the shape, right? You can't right. let the, the tools and the software dictate how you want your design to evolve. Uh, but to that example, I've now created, and we'll just maybe hide this, I'm going to continue on with my little crown example. Uh, and I'm going to create a, a boundary surface to create that, that crown shape. Uh, and so what I've done is on the front plane, because this has some symmetry, so I need to create half, I've created a degree four style spline. Degree four, because I need the three sections in, uh, in the you know, be main collinear for my G3 connection. And you can see that with that smooth transition. Uh, and then this last one, I don't actually, you know, I don't need to make a curvature continuous. I'm not intending to do that. Um, and so if I really wanted to, to really lock this down, I could add an angle here and that would, yeah, I could, but it didn't like that. Even though if I didn't have the angle, there's no reason why I can't slide that around. Uh, it may just be easier to make it to this rather than the internal geometry. Yeah, and now it liked it. It just didn't like it made to the control segment sure. versus the the line. So we'll lock that uh, lock that down. But I need to have this uh, this profile here. I also would like to have the profile over here, right? Because this is a almost like a swept section. But I'm I'm using the boundary surface tool to create it uh, rather than the sweep. Uh, and to do that, I'm using a derive sketch. Uh, so the way that we can in, in, insert a derive sketch is select the sketch we want. And in this case, select the plane that we want to derive it to. And what this does is create a parametrically driven copy of my first sketch. So if I ever run into a scenario where I want to have you know, a sketch on a different plane that might be, say, at a different angle, mm -hmm. um, if I was just to convert it, or I, I would have that projection of the sketch and it wouldn't be a a proper copy, right? Uh, but derive sketch just creates something on a different plane that is a parametrically driven copy. So I can add some relations to tie this down. And now this is fully defined. And so if we were to you know, see how this one changes in real time, so we'll just make a very exaggerated shape change, I do the same over here. So I don't have to worry about two different sketches for creating this style of geometry, I can drive it all with one. And this is a huge time saver rather than setting up um, global variables or such to be able to, or, or different mathematical relations to be able to support this style of uh, feature. Yeah, I think this is one of those hidden underutilized uh, features inside of SOLIDWORKS, being able to create those derived sketches so that whatever I do on this one, you know, whatever plane, wherever else I've used that sketch, it updates to reflect that. Yeah, one of those features where it's great that you know that it exists because there's very specific applications uh, for it. Yep. I was working on a, uh, a product that was a, uh, it was a convertible uh, trike or scooter um, for, for toddlers. Uh, and there was a portion of the device that was kind of this like humped saddle shape that the child would sit on and then to make the device go from a like a you know a push trike to a stand up scooter, you took that portion off and then you snapped it onto the front, and it can became part of the scooter fairing. But it gotcha. was the drive sketch was great of trying to line up those different shapes where I took you know this this fow or this this cowl you know shape right and this cowling mm -hmm. and took it from one portion and then moved it over here. And I had to get different geometries to line up. I had to get the draft angles that were on the one part to also look right when you moved into another portion of the product, have a little lip for that thing to li live on in different orientations. And Derive Sketch was a you know huge helper in being able to translate that geometry. Got it. Nice. So this is a this is a surface. The, you're using a boundary surface here as opposed to a solid. Yep. So this is a surface because there's no good way. I, I could have done this with a sweep. Sweep. Um, I just tend to gravitate towards the boundary surface tool because it gives really nice results and it has a yep. little bit more control. Uh, so some of the inputs I've had to set up here, uh, I'm setting this uh, tangent to face. Um, there is a curvature continuous option uh, in the feature here, but I find that if you've already set up your curves to drive this, 
you don't have to worry about the internal uh, feature continuity as much. Okay. Uh, and so that's why I'm only using tangency because I do have these two G3 uh, connections to drive this. Uh, I'm setting the normal to profile. I need to have normal or to profile when I'm going across the mirror plane to make sure that I don't have a, a crease or a hump, right? I want it to be perfectly normal at the mid plane. And likewise, because this is also a mirror plane, I'm setting the, the normal to profile. Got it. Uh, a couple other options in, in boundary surface. I have tangent influence. And the way I think about tangent influence is inflating a balloon uh, or a beach ball. So the lower the tangent influence, it could be that you didn't quite give it enough pumps. You know, it was almost uh, a little bit deflated uh, and dragging the tangent influence up to 100 makes it you've, you've really pumped up that shape and the, the shape is following what it wants to be. Um, and this is once again, you know, to your point, Steve, you have to use your eyes and you have to use the analysis tools to determine you know, what you got at the end. Right. So looking at this, I look use the curvature tool to see that I have this you know very clean curvature, right? I have this this ramp up uh, and this this gradual fade out. And once again, if I look at my zebra stripes, you know I see that smooth transition rather than that hard edge on my right. zebra stripes as that shape wraps around. So, you know that really seamless transition. You know another great great application I've ran into for this type of work is not only in product design, but if you ever have received imported geometry that is missing faces, missing holes, not, you know, whatever it was, it was pushed out of did not come out clean. Um, these types of tools come in really handy for that, those cases too, where you're literally having to like rebuild parts of the parts of the geometry. Um, this is hundred uh, percent. I don't know what it was when I took it years ago, the CSWP mold tools example, it actually borrows some of the same uh, questions from the surfacing uh, CSWP mm -hmm. because it, you, you do deal with a lot of imported geometry. A lot of the time you have to you know, clean up, maybe not geometry that comes in, but geometry that has errors with it. You have to delete those faces so that right. way you don't have, you, know, you can actually work with it. Um, and then the surfacing tools come in, you know, you know, that's the way to fix these kind of models. Um, yeah, so lots of applications outside of just creating beautiful shapes. It's it's the same, it's understanding the toolkit, right? That when you think about breaking the model down face by face, yep. rather than feature by feature, it's a different way of thinking about the geometry and a different way about modeling the geometry. And thinking in features is, you know, it supercharges you. You're, you can be faster when you think in extrude and fill it and revolve. But when you're doing surface modeling, you're thinking in sketches, you're thinking in layouts, you're thinking right. in boundary surfaces and surface sweeps and such and such. And you have to be a lot more deliberate about every input that you're giving the software to be able to get what you want out of it. Uh, and once again, it's, it's why I advocate if you don't have to use surfaces, don't use them. But when they're the only way of getting the job done, well, use them. Right. Uh, so continuing through this uh, this little example, I wanted to finish off this this crown shape. Um, so once again, leveraging symmetry to uh, to mirror this through, uh, and then I'm using some surface fill features. Uh, this is a great little way, even if you're working with solid models, to quickly bring them back, or if you convert them into surface body, you can actually create solids directly in the surface fill uh, to be able to to make your solid models complete. And I needed to do this to be able to mirror this because the bottom of this device has the symmetry and I can set myself up for the next portion of the modeling where I want to do this transition to our, uh, to our top shape where this display is going to live. Uh, so I've created the plane that the display will live on. Uh, you named it in the tree. It's just a planar surface. Um, so once again, another way of working face by face. And I now need to start uh, creating the transition from the main shape up to this. Uh, so in order to do this, I can't quite use a revolve in this instance because I have this style spline section here. It's not a perfect uh, radius. So I have to go about using the boundary surface tool uh, to do this. And, and this is another you know, downside of, of doing this level of modeling. It takes more time, it takes mm -hmm. more features. Um, versus just putting a revolve in there. 
And so if a revolve was going to be sufficient for your purposes, you know, I would do that. Um, I wouldn't do this in, in the upfront portion of the design process. I want to be able to save time. I want to be efficient. You know, I want to quickly maybe get a 3D print of this to hold it in my hand and see it's the right size. Does it feel well? Uh, does it feel right? And then as the design evolves and it might be ready to, to kind of do a final master model design before uh, having some engineering input to integrate the display, integrate the PCB, uh, integrate the fastening features, whether it be snaps or screws, lips and grooves. I want to make sure I have that really refined exterior geometry. And that's where I'll take the time to build a really robust uh, service model uh, sure. of the uh, of the product. Uh, so this is just a, a surface with a bit of a crown. Uh, once again, using that normal to profile, I don't, uh, don't have any other constraints within this surface, but it's setting up the beginning of my blend. Uh, and this is where, where surface fill comes in great. Uh, it is a master at creating five-sided transitions. <laughs> uh, so boundary surface is great for, for four sides. You always want the boundary surface to have you know, four sides. If you look at this shape, it is inherently four-sided, even though it went around corners. It's got a top and a bottom and a left and a right. right. Uh, the transition that we're looking to set up here uh, and we'll we'll frame this out is inherently five sided, uh, and this is where surface fill gets used in the modeling workflow. You know, we want boundary surface. I couldn't use it here because uh, how could I create a boundary from here to these two disjoint edges? You right. know, I might have had to create some kind of intermediate blend, and that is possible to do. There there are some workflows that break four or five sided shapes or seven or eight whatever number of sides down to four sided solutions. Uh, but surface fill, when set up properly, gives you a solution that works 95% of the time uh, with a wonderful fidelity. Sure. So the final bit I have here, um, so surface fill, I can't control the insides of a surface fill like I can control the boundary surface. It doesn't have those tangent influence sliders. Um, so I need to provide inputs to shape it. Uh, and so as part of that, I'm creating a surface extrude with the style spline G3 connection, because now with this surface extrude as compared to just the sketch, I can actually set the surface fill to be tangent and follow this shape. And so that's why this is here as compared to just using the sketch. Yeah, it's almost like uh, it's like custom reference geometry, right? Exactly. You're exactly. using it purely just so that you can build out the rest of the blend. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I found is that it can sometimes be helpful to knit these this reference geometry into the model to have this closed five-sided perimeter uh, and from here it's a matter of selecting your edges and defining the inputs uh, once again if you have really clean edges i don't see the need for curvature continuity and i can actually introduce some ripples uh, and little bumps in mm -hmm. your surface fill so I like to just keep it uh, keep it tangent. So the edges that need to be smooth, and this edge I want to, to match this geometry, it's made tangent. But the other edges where I, you know, I do have that G0 connection, uh, contact are just, are just set to contact. Likewise, these edges here are made tangent and I'll build the feature and then examine the feature with the curvature tool. So we can see this kind of olive color starts blending out in this corner, we see that this radius starts blending out and this radius starts getting gradually bigger as yep. it moves up to the circle shape. And then we see the start of the flat shape kind of kicking up to, uh, to the display area. Uh, I'll also use the zebra stripes tool to examine my surface. It can even increase the overall quality um, with, in terms of the overall stripe accuracy. And then from there, I just like moving the, the view around to make sure that I actually got what I needed. Yeah. And if I didn't like the shape that I was getting, I would look to change the, uh, the input. So maybe I would move this edge back a little bit more or move this edge up a little bit more just to control the exact shape of the blend and then the internal shape of the fill surface. But I'm seeing this very nice, smooth connection here the light is flowing, you know, away and away, you know, in a solution that I like here. That it, it's kind of gradually coming back to this edge. Likewise, the light along this big fillet is kicking up towards the perimeter. 
Yep. And it's flowing, you know, around here nicely. If this was going to be something that maybe I think I think the scale of the objects you're also working on, you know, plays a factor. This is a small handheld device. And so if there's a little minor deviance in the exact perfection of that surface, it's most likely not going to be noticed because of how small it is. But if this was, say, the shape of a new autonomous vehicle, you know, that was the size of a, a car, you know, you yeah. would notice any little tiny minor deviation in that surface just because of the scale of the object. Uh, and you also have to likewise think of the, the surface finish. You know, this part's most likely going to be uh, a textured plastic or so that texture is going to hide some of the, the surface reflections you know, that might hide some of the, you know, the nature. And that's why I find that surface fill gets you where you need to be 95% of the time. If I had split this up into four sided patches, I could have had something that was probably a little bit higher fidelity, but it would have taken me a lot longer. It would have been a lot less robust from a parametric standpoint. Uh, and, you know, quite frankly, this gets the job done. It allows yeah. me to, uh, to finish the design, to, you know, split this up into its component parts, add the display, add the buttons, you know, add the draft angles as needed. And then I have a, a nice robust, uh, master model that can get uh, used for for further detailing and child parts. This is uh, this is awesome, Andrew. I, I you got you've gotten a lot of great feedback. Uh, beautiful, wonderful explanation. I think people really have enjoyed you walking through just kind of the the basics of how this works, um, which is so important because then you can build on. You can start to do lots of things once you understand the basics uh, of of this. So. Thank you for taking the time to walk us through this. Um, I know you've got a couple uh, resources where you've posted your, um, I think your 3D Experience World sessions and whatnot. Do you want to talk a little bit about those just so people know where they can get more, uh, more info from you? For sure. Uh, so I have given six different talks at uh, various worlds over the years. Uh, all of those talks uh, recorded, thanks to Dassault. Um, but for posterity's sake, I throw them up on my own YouTube, so that way you know they don't get lost uh, you know, over time. So if you are looking at uh, you know building out some of this knowledge, uh, jump a lot of it into Will It Blend, uh, both from 2014 and most recently 2013. And for more details on just the overall theory of surface modeling check out surfaces and splines or Zen and the art of solidworks surfacing. Uh, if you're into the details of plastic part design, uh, I've got a session that covers a bunch of different techniques for modeling features that you see in plastic parts. Uh, and then I have a fun one, which is all about examining different modeling workflows uh, with mid-century modern furniture, uh, which is a passion slash hobby slash collection of, uh, of mine. Oh, I love uh, it. And then uh, if you, it's one of my favorite design styles as well. It's so good. Uh, luckily, my uh, my wife also sees eye to eye. So when we <laughs> merged our respective households, didn't have to get rid of a lot of the uh, the Eames pieces uh, and Saren awesome. pieces that I collected over the years. Oh, that's uh, awesome. And also, I you know I invite people to uh, connect with me directly on LinkedIn. Uh, I think we'll have some of those those links up in chat. So if you do have a modeling you know, question or something that you run into, you know, just give me a quick message, you know, reach out, happy to, uh, to connect with people and to, you know, help them along their way. You know, I, I put this content together just in the interest of giving back to the community. You know, SolidWorks has been such a powerful tool, you know, for me and, and a way that I've been able to, you know, have a very successful career in, uh, in product development. And, you know, some of those lessons I've learned along the way, just want to be able to, to document them and, and get them out for people to learn from. That's great. Thank you again for your time and for the rest of our audience. Be sure to subscribe and like. Obviously, we do SolidWorks Live and live designs pretty regularly. Uh, so make sure that you're signed up to be notified for those so that you can continue to consume uh, great presenters like uh, like Andrew. So, Andrew, again, thank you. And uh, to everyone else on the call, uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks, guys.